In the small supernatural town of Wellington, New Zealand, a documentary crew's granted protection by four vampires while they follow them around. The town's crawling with dozens of creatures who prowl the streets every night as they're unable to enter buildings without invitations. Every night at 6 p.m. Sharp Viargo wakes from his slumber to the most terrifying part of his day, confirming that the sun set. The 380-year-old leader of the household's heavily inspired by interview with a vampire and immigrated for a woman, but his servant put the wrong postage on his coffin and he was lost in transit. 18 months later he reached New Zealand but she had already found another man and is now a 96-year-old widow that he still visits from afar. He also keeps a locket gifted to him as a token to remember her by but it's made of pure silver so he's unable to withstand it. The second flatmate's an 800-year-old Dracula type in Vladislav the Poker, who attained his title from impaling peasants when he was in a bad place mentally. He was turned into a vampire when he was only 16 and hasn't aged a day since. He was once a powerful being and could draw in crowds at a time, now he can't even hypnotize a single person unless they're looking directly at him. He suffered a humiliating defeat at the hands of the beast and has never been the same since. The third tenant's the 8,000-year-old Nosferatu type Peter residing beneath the house. Though he's a party animal and joins them at every unholy masquerade and has a growing number of spinal columns around his stone tomb. The final flatmate's the rebellious young deacon, who at only 183 years old has his design based on the lost boys and spends his days knitting. As a traveling salesman a creature took him into its dungeon beneath its castle and turned him into a vampire, and they've been friends ever since. Eventually he worked for the Third Reich until losing the war and fleeing to New Zealand with Peter. After feeding the grumpy Strigoi chicken for breakfast the leader tells the other two that Peter won't be joining them. The three clearly haven't adjusted to the 21st century and remind Deacon that it's been his turn to clean the bloody dishes for five years. Vlad's old school and suggests maybe they get some slaves to do it, but as tension rises between the dandy and Deacon he's eventually convinced to wash them himself. Tonight the boys are going into town like always but must first look their best. Since they need to attract their victims they go for a look that Vlad calls dead but delicious, and since they have no reflection they must use ill-attempted sketches to showcase their appearances to one another. After catching a bus into town they meet other bloodsuckers draining locals and catching perverts. They visit the vampire-owned Big Kamara as it's the only place they're welcome but it's dead of any living customers. The three split up with Deacon meeting with his familiar Jackie, who he's promised eternal life to should she accomplish all the mundane tasks that he gives her. He's led her on for four and a half years with no intention of ever biting her, and instead orders her to bring some virgins to the house for dinner. We see that Viargo's already found someone and is serenading her, before hearing her ambitions and feeling bad for what's to come. He covers the floor with newspaper and puts on a bib before accidentally missing his target and sending arterial spray all over the room. The next day Jackie contacts some people she despises in hopes they'll visit the house for the vampires to feast on. They show up expecting to catch up with Jackie and instead join the vampires for dinner. She brought Josephine who insulted her back in school and her ex-boyfriend Nick. When the vampires discover their guests aren't virgins they're disappointed as they don't like their meals to be spoiled. During dinner Deacon makes Nick believe that his spaghetti's really worms just like in The Lost Boys. He freaks out and attempts to leave but is chased around the haunted house while Viargo kills Josephine in another gory mishap. When Deacon comes at him from inside his backpack Nick throws it away and stumbles down the stairs. He briefly manages to escape the house but is killed by Peter much to the disappointment of the others, especially Jackie who has to clean up. Nick survives the attack and goes to the hospital to get Peter's bite looked at, but they're of no help. For the next two months he suffers a slow transformation that he likens to a terrible hangover. When he's finally ready he returns to the house where Deacon's in the middle of a performance for the boys. They all accept Nick into their group except for Deacon who feels he's being replaced as the young blood. The vampires eventually meet Nick's human friend Stu who they decide not to eat as he seems nice. Not only that, but he introduces them to modern technology and teaches Viago how to fight. He shows them their first sunrise in years via video and gives them a camera to finally see themselves. He's even liked by Deacon who's pranked by Viago with a text message about a crucifix being behind him. Nick's able to get the group invited into the hottest clubs in Wellington making Deacon envious of the younger vamp's growing popularity. When they all walk home the vampires encounter their centuries-long rivals. The two sides trade insults while the werewolf leader Anton reminds his boys no foul language as they're werewolves not swearwolves. One night Stu gets Viargo in contact with his former familiar Philip who's now an old man. The servant says he's been waiting all this time for his master to return and make him immortal, which the vampire again had no intention of doing and ends the call in shame. While out on the town Nick begins to carelessly reveal himself to be a vampire to everyone he meets. 
Deacon confronts him on it and they begin to have a bat fight to the amusement of the other flatmates, but the old vampire wins with his many years of experience. When he flies away Deacon goes to Jackie's to take his frustration out on her, claiming that he was going to make her a vampire tonight but Nick ruined everything. Stu knows they're vampires but doesn't really care, as Nick attempts Deacon's trick of making him think he's eating worms but it fails. Against the other's recommendation, Nick eats a single piece of potato and throws up gallons of blood as a side effect of being a vampire. He goes home miserable that he can no longer eat his favorite food, when the next morning the group wake to find Peter on fire from what they suspect to be a fatal sunlight accident. On further investigation Deacon deduces that a vampire hunter broke in through the basement window but was crushed under Peter's tomb when he woke. Nick recognizes the hunter as one of the people he revealed his identity to in the club the other night, so Deacon becomes furious and chases him around the house. Vlad holds him back before they're interrupted by a police welfare check from officers O'Leary and Minot. Viargo is able to hypnotize them into thinking nothing of the floating men in the kitchen, and instead just has them issuing numerous infringement notices for fire hazards around the home. They also completely ignore the dead hunter and the charred remains of Peter, and once they leave Nick's put on trial for his crimes and banished from the flat indefinitely. They still allow Stu to visit and take Nick out to the yard for the procession of shame before his exile, which is just them chanting shame and letting him leave. Months pass when the vampires receive an invitation to this year's unholy masquerade. It's Vlad's favorite event, but this year he refuses to attend after learning that the beast is the guest of honor. He claims to have had great battles with it in a swamp, on a cliff, and in the bathroom at a nightclub, and instead of going he just stays home and does his dark bidding over the internet while beginning to decay. Only Viago and Deacon attend and join a crowded bowling hall full of all manner of supernatural creatures. They find Jackie in attendance who Deacon's disgusted to learn has been turned into a vampire by Nick. He's also brought along with him Stu which everyone's happy to see, when the host comes on stage and introduces the guest of honor, the Beast and Vlad's ex-girlfriend Pauline. It's just his nickname for her after the two went through multiple violent breakups which left Vlad beaten and powerless. Later in the night the group introduce themselves to Pauline when she smells that Stu and the camera crew are human. The zombies also get a taste for his blood and the entire party turn on them. Stu attempts to introduce himself but the mention of being a computer analyst makes them assume he's a virgin and just want to eat him even more. Just then Vlad makes his dramatic entrance but his ex doesn't recognize his voice and starts listing off other lovers in an attempt to guess. He reveals himself refreshed and picks a fight with Pauline's new boyfriend and what looks like burn victim Julian. They throw down in a battle of biblical proportions, until Vlad's overpowered and recites that it's forbidden for a vampire to kill another, so Stu runs a stake through Julian's back and saves his friend. They escape the ball and begin to celebrate Stu with songs of his praise, when encountering Anton's werewolf pack chaining themselves to trees in a park. They're about to transform due to the full moon, and get distracted by little things like forgetting the code to the padlock and not remembering to wear their stretchy pants. Suddenly the moon peeks out from behind a cloud and the pack begins to transform rapidly. They chase after the fleeing vampires and kill a cameraman who falls behind. The vamps can avoid the pack just by hovering a few feet above them but Stu's unable and is mauled to death while his friends watch. Afterwards Deacon shows his first piece of compassion towards Nick and consoles him on the loss of his friend. He says some wise words about everyone Nick knows dying eventually since he's now an immortal, but then goes on a tangent about Stu probably would have wanted to go with his face torn to shreds and his guts splayed out all over the trees. When they leave the moronic officers find Stu disemboweled and blame it on a family's border collie which they order to be put down. The flatmates' lives turn to shambles without Stu, and Deacon's even caught sleeping with the curtains open in the morning but is saved and put in his cupboard by Viago. One night Nick returns to the house with Stu, having survived the attack and been turned into a werewolf before escaping the officers. He's brought along his new pack who put aside their differences for the sake of their mutual friend. Anton makes a joke about the moon on Deacon's sweater hopefully not making them transform prematurely, and just like that the centuries long feud's over, despite the smell of wet dog now filling the house. Nick's banishments ended and Viargo reconnects with his 96-year-old ex-girlfriend who he's now turned into a vampire. It doesn't bother him that he's four times her age and instead he insists that they're going to be together forever. The power dynamic shifted in Jackie's household with her husband now her servant and her as master. In the final scene Deacon attempts to hypnotize you into forgetting the last hour and a half of what you've just watched. And the movie ends. You will forget the contents of this movie.